This is episode 11 of Design Discipline, a conversation with Office of Possibilities, or OP in short. OP is a multidisciplinary design studio that creates objects and spaces based on well-informed strategic ideas with competences spanning architecture, art direction, exhibition design, industrial design, brand strategy, graphic design, and innovation strategy. I've personally been following OP since they were founded. In fact, as they were moving into their studio space in Gothenburg in Sweden a couple of years ago, I was living in the same building, right above their studio. Since then, they have built a formidable portfolio of projects involving brand identity, product design, architecture, exhibition design, and more, with clients such as Volvo, Ikea, H&M, voice scooters, and Electron music machines. I went back to my old neighborhood and sat down with Peter Hillinge and Kaspar Andren, two of the studio's four co-founders, in order to get to know them better. We talked about their personal journeys that led to owning a design studio together, how they grew their company 100% during the COVID pandemic, in part due to their experience in functioning as a remote distributed team, how they communicate, sell, and execute truly interdisciplinary work, the great designers that they have learned from, the tensions between business and creativity, and many other topics that shed some light on the actual work of design. This was a truly wide-ranging conversation, so feel free to use the bookmarks that you will find in the description to jump around, and head over to designdiscipline.com op if you would like to have a look at a lightly edited transcript of the entire conversation. If you find any of this interesting, I'm sure you will also enjoy past and future episodes of Design Discipline, where we explore and explain the vast landscape of design by having conversations with scholars, leaders, and creatives, as well as explaining concepts that are useful for design professionals today. So go ahead and download and subscribe to our podcast, like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Instagram as at Design Discipline, and join the membership program on our website, designdiscipline.com, to access exclusive content as you enjoy our conversation with Peter Hillinge and Kaspar Andren from OP, Office of Possibilities. I guess, first of all, like, what do you exactly do here? Like, how do you define uh, the, the value that you create for your clients and for yourselves? Well, first of all, um, uh, we're part of the co-founders. We're two yeah. Uh, yeah. out of four. So uh, there's also uh, Robert and Axel. Mm. And uh, yeah, me and Petter, we live in Gothenburg. So Axel lives in Stockholm and Robert uh, down in uh, Lund in Skåne. Mm. We work with design in different aspects. We are like different disciplines. Uh, so uh, I'm from an engineering background and Petter is... Uh, I'm yeah. from a product design and um, industrial an design yeah. background. And Robert is an architect and, uh, and uh, Axel uh, is also an industrial designer. We work with design in both product design and architecture and graphic design. Mm -hmm. I think of design as a more of a strategic tool uh, to our clients. It's very common to think of design as, yeah, we need it in the end to style the thing, to sell it or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, we would like to like more work with our clients with design as a strategic tool as much as like the manufacturing or mm. like the uh, sales channels or like it's part of the process of making something successful. Mm. Uh, even if it's like an exhibition or a product mm. or a house or so. And I think why we combine our fields of work is that we don't see uh, design as only one thing or like we, only don't, we don't see graphic design as only graphic design. All of a sudden a, a sign becomes a physical object and then it's a product and then you know, you walk into the sign, and then it's a, it's a building. Uh, so mm. I, th I think we see we see it as one, mm. uh, basically. We don't see it as different genres. Wow. No, I think we we've tried to define it uh, on our uh, web page. <laughs> as most startups, it's like okay, so what's our thing? And uh, I think we would like to be. We don't want to be the thing. Static, the thing to be static. We want it to evolve, but we are now at the point where we think that we work with objects and spaces uh, for some in in some sense. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's from a physical standpoint yeah. at least, 
but uh, physical starting point at least. Yeah, mm. uh, but it's like it could be a product, but it could also be a building or an environment. Or mm. it's about creating the impact for for the customer. And I think when we work with uh, our customers or clients, we we like to challenge them. Mm. Uh, they they think they want to make something because they need a new product and maybe they need a new product, but we want to challenge and understand why they need a new product because, and in what context and maybe how will you launch it and how will you package it and how yeah. will you... And, and uh, you need to really understand the whole picture and I think we want to be part of that whole picture, somehow be part of the whole journey. Yeah, uh, so. and I mean, that all depends of course on on the size of the client and, yeah. and so on. I mean, sometimes we can just be in a part of it. And uh, in some cases we can do the whole thing, but we want to make sure that whatever we get engaged with, it's gonna be as good as it can get. I mean, the name Office of Possibilities, oh, yeah. it's like, it's part of that. It's like, That's why cool. not take the challenge? Why not make an effort and try it out at least? And mm. the worst thing that could happen is that you fail and then you just try another one. And then you learn and then yeah, you do exactly. it again. So then that's you know how you come forward. In that sounds in really world. smart. I mean, it's uh, kind of challenging to work, make some of these things work in practice. And I mm. would like to ask you about those uh, at, at some point, but I'm also curious about how you got to this point. So like, what's your story? What's the story of the studio? What's the, what's the story of you two as individuals who got involved in this kind of career and then subsequently in this company? I was uh, more or less forced into this business by, uh, <laughs> by a father who's an architect. Oh, wow. So like uh, my siblings are all architects and landscape architects. And uh, I, um, Became a product designer, started studying product design in high school, and then in Lund, and then started working in Copenhagen mm. as a product designer uh, for a company called Kilo, which is a part of Big now, mm. Gerking and Scoop. Yeah, they are, they're super famous in the world of architecture, I guess. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. They had a small part of it doing product design. Mm. and uh, But then at that point, I also started doing somewhat architecture mm. like doing uh, bus stops and larger train stops and that's mm. like i was on a um i was doing products that became so big structures that they they were more or less architecture um, mm. which kind of stuck um, and at that point i also worked with uh, robert one of our other co-founders mm. and uh, because he worked that big he worked that big yeah. exactly mm. so that's where we kind of and we also studied together, so it all kind of, and we were always discussing this in the future, if we had an office, hmm. we would never work like this. So, you know, we yeah. would never do that. We oh, would, yeah. um, so we had some somehow really interesting uh, ideas and thoughts about how to run a business and hmm. what to focus on and what not to focus on and so on. But uh, after Copenhagen, I moved back to Gothenburg um, I got a few clients here that wanted to do uh, design and and uh, I opened up my own small kind of freelance um, uh, business and uh, did that for three years before we somehow uh, uh, all, I think... Um, yeah, because you and Axel, you met in Lund. Absolutely. Yeah. At uh, Industrial Design there. Yeah. So you, you and Axel know each other yeah. since that time and, but it and was also a, talked about starting. Absolutely. And we were all, uh, that's what I meant, we were all we were all four in somehow a stage in life. We were all kind of urging to do something mm. uh, new and uh, to kind of lift the possibilities of what we could do together. Mm. Uh, nice. And I think me and Axel have been discussing this since we studied and, and Robert uh, as well. And then and then we, we knew each other from, from here, actually, yeah. in Gothenburg. Um, we ran in this running club together, yeah. <laughs> and uh, our girlfriends uh, knew each other since, like, childhood. So, uh, yeah. So, so that somehow, I mean, that's, that's my at least end of the story, like, how, how, how we met. And, um, and 
I mean, you can yeah, do yeah, your I'm, story as well. I guess I'm a bit of a joker in this <laughs> <laughs> this part, but uh, so I'm uh, uh, I'm from a, a background where my dad is an economist and my mother is an artist. So it's like structure and <laughs> creativity, so yes, to speak. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then uh, so I've always been fascinated in like sketching since I. Uh, thought I could sketch uh, and uh, during my whole life and so on. So we actually went to the same high school, mm -hmm. uh, like with this uh, more design uh, angle mm -hmm. to the high school uh, called Polhems Gymnasium here in Gothenburg. Uh, it's pretty famous in that kind of sense, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then I studied engineering because uh, I always like to pull things apart, <laughs> maybe not put them together, yeah. uh, and uh, are fascinated about cars and stuff like that. So I went to uh, Linköping uh, University, I uh, uh, thought I was going to work with uh, fighter jets because I thought they were awesome, <laughs> uh, and uh, realized that that will not be the case. That seems really boring. You're mm. just calculating all the time. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I studied mechanical engineering there. And then I got the job at a brand agency firm here in Gothenburg, where I worked with uh, uh, within a really cool team, working with product development as a part of brand development. Mm. Wow. So we looked into more like how could, if you're changing your brand, how could your products like take that step as well? Mm. What should you do? More from maybe an innovative perspective mm. and had a really great boss that is a true visionary mm. and has been like, uh, yeah, he had like several companies before and yeah, it's like he can already see the idea um, uh, before you even understand the problem. Mm. <laughs> he sees the solution. So mm. it was a really fun time and we, we also started like a separate company there mm. oh, uh, nice. that uh, I could be a part of. Uh, so we were scaling up the team, working more towards innovation and so on. Mm. Um, and then, um, yeah, but then from my background, I mean, my, my dad is an entrepreneur and my mom is an entrepreneur, mm. so they are having their own businesses. So I was always thinking about like, I also want to start my own business. And uh, then we started to talk. Oh. So that was like, yeah, then we met and it, it all happened really fast. Mm. I think we started talking at a running session, mm. actually, uh, in oh. maybe like October. And I think a couple of weeks after we, you were uh, also part of the, the Ford kind of group. Yeah, where we, exactly. Where we decided that we were, we're going to try this. Mm. Um, and then we started the company in uh, the beginning of January. So it was like three October, years. November, December, and then. What is the state of play now? Like how many people do you have? What like size wise, where are you at today? We're nine at yeah. the moment. Mm. Um, we're specifically uh, like uh, if we're three architects, I, I would say three designers and two graphic designers, basically. Mm. In, in, and then... Uh, and that's really interesting because uh, for us to be nine today, it's mm. like last year we were five yeah. and in the end we were six. So we were like, okay, this is mm. about right. And uh, yeah, last year was pretty... It was interesting. Wow. I mean, we learned a lot, mm. uh, of course. and. Uh, as a new business, you, you're like, okay, so now there's a, yeah. <laughs> a pandemic going on and mm, yeah. how to cope with that and everything. Oh, you grew to almost like twice the size during like yeah, COVID. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we, we had like a really chill first half of the year mm. and then we try, uh, yeah, started to pick up speed uh, mm. towards the end. And then this year has just exploded uh, for us in that sense. I mean, we're still a small company, but for us being like four and now are nine within three and a half years, it's oh, wow. like, yeah. Yeah, I remember when you set up actually, I was actually living in this building yeah, when you yeah, started this, and we didn't know each other back then, no. but I was, you know, getting out of my apartment and I was seeing like, there's this thing in the corner going on. I yeah. think it was 
this was like a solarium or something. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you were building this place and it became a design studio. And I was like, wow, I should meet these guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now, now we succeeded. But I'm wondering, um, during this period of time where you like started the company, now you're like sort of twice the size. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recall any like particular actions or investments that gave you like a disproportionate kind of return in terms of setting you up for success? And are there any actions or investments that uh, went sort of very badly compared to the other things that you've done in your business? This place. Mm. It's like uh, we started uh, actually uh, in the living room, mm. like because mm. we didn't for the first weeks and uh, we had the contract with, with Volvo and mm. IKEA and so on. So we didn't need a space that much. But no. then we had. Uh, a couple of seats at this co-working space mm -hmm. uh, in Gothenburg, uh, but figured out pretty early on that that was only temporary because mm -hmm. you need your own space where you can like leave stuff and build models and and it becomes a real company when you have your own space. Yeah, you know, when you put your name onto like a building, mm -hmm. or as we have done the windows, it's mm -hmm. like okay, so you exist. <laughs> it's so. Uh, There's a physical place where you can actually visit you guys. Yeah, like, exactly. That's where you we are. can have a meeting at our place. It's like mm. uh, you you get more confident, and uh, I think the clients also trust you even more. It, it seems stupid, but um, it was a very scary investment for us. Like, yeah. yeah, because you. Yeah. Um, uh, the normal case is that you you get it for three years, and I mean at the moment we've. We had only existed like for a couple of months, mm. so seeing three like years in the future is uh, scary in a way. But those three years went like that, and then yeah. yeah, I mean, we I think we we didn't know if we could pay like salary that month when we signed the this office. deal for three years. Wow, and we were like, yeah, fuck it. I don't know if I can swear, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's <laughs> let's do it. let's do that, let's and that's it, yeah. something you notice when you're like you need to gas a bit because whenever you put the gas pedal down, you get so much back. Yeah. Of course, you can't be like all YOLO and <laughs> go nuts. <laughs> you need, uh, of course, a little bit of braking as well. But um, it's like with when you staff up as well, mm -hmm. and uh, it's like. Should we? Should we not? We're not sure about. Could we really pay the salary for this person and everything? Mm. And then you hire hire one, and mm. you like they are super creative, give more energy to the company, more things are happening, mm. and suddenly you're like, why didn't we do that earlier? Mm. Nice. So mm. that would I would mm. say that this place. I don't know if that's the same today oh. uh, with the landscape of digital meetings and everything, mm. but back then yeah. <laughs> absolutely for sure uh, and we're actually looking at yeah. place in stockholm so i think we're oh, nice. we we're, want to have a similar studio in a way in, in stockholm yeah um, to have Ooh. a physical place there so we still believe in that at yeah. least to have a physical space and the importance mm. of it yeah um, even if it's not like mainly for meeting customers and so on but to have a place where you can Okay, I go to work and where I can be creative and meet the yeah. others. And I think it's also important when you're working with like physical products, mm. architectural prototypes. It really pays off to have your space because it's like like I do some product design work and I work from my living room most of the time, and it's really hard to uh, sort of to maintain the kind of the aesthetic of the living room at the yeah. same time as being creative with the products and things. I think, I mean, we have a small workshop here, but uh, uh, at least my goal is to have, a, you know, uh, just one full floor of only oh, yeah. machines where mm. we can build things. Um, that would be so cool. That would be uh, amazing. I'd yeah. love to have that myself. Yeah. But you also mentioned that you have a, 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 a many sort of people on your team living in different places. So we're in Gothenburg right mm. now, but you mentioned yeah. someone is in... Uh, did Malmö yeah, yeah. in Lund. Um, so it seems that remote working has been a thing for you for many years. Like, how do you have any experiences that that are interesting regarding that? Because now everyone is doing it. Yeah. But it seems like you guys have been doing it for a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah I mean, that was 
I would say we knew it from the beginning <laughs> yeah. because Axel lives in Stockholm and Robert uh, then he lived in Malmö. Yeah, we just had to deal with it. But yeah. uh, we were fortunate to have like a small apartment where they could stay when they were here, and they were they were here quite a lot in the yeah, beginning, two three days a week at least. Uh, so they were sacrificing a lot in that sense. Mm -hmm. But we also had like most of the clients here and, and so on. So it felt naturally. Do you have any like habits, rituals, processes to keep you all in sync? Like do you have uh, weekly we have, meetings or how does it work for you? daily meetings every morning. Yeah. Uh, basically at least us four, but also the full team. So um, every morning we have a, at least 15 to 30 minutes of just mm. talking uh, to the full group. Mm. And that's like more or less the starting point of every day. Um, and it has been really, really, really good for us because in 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 one way when COVID kind of came in, uh, mm. we didn't really know how to handle it mm. because then at that time before that, we would always meet a couple of times a week, and mm. then you you would have all of those time to discuss projects and mm. how things were going and so on. And uh, and I think this this morning meeting was very very good for us. Yeah, and it's. It's also been uh, quite hard to find like ways to collaborate creatively mm. online. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a been problem. a challenge. I mean, having meetings with clients and like mm. just mm. do checkups and discuss things, mm. totally fine. Of course, okay. Teams and all the programs mm. working fine for that. But to work like creatively solving a problem, it I think we have find found some tools to do that, but. That's still more to come, we feel, in that space. And uh -huh. we feel a lot of energy to still meet and like be physical in, or be physical. What's, <laughs> I mean, to, to meet and, and interact together and solve a problem. I mean, seeing each other for a day or two at the, in Lund or here or in Stockholm mm. will easily solve like a week's uh, yeah, worth of absolutely. work. Okay. I think we've solved uh, by by digital tools, we've solved a way where we can kind of find inspiration, find uh, references, the uh, starting point of a project, but it's still the, the fact of uh, creating the concepts, yeah. like sitting next to each other, sketching. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm looking at something you sketched, mm. which looks like something, and I, I in my mind it looks like something else, and then I sketch on something, and you know, that kind of interaction is really hard to do. And you overheard digitally. here someone talking about the problem or you, exactly. and you can get input or... Yeah. When so. you're doing this remotely, are there any like tools or, or software or ways of doing things that you really sort of... Uh, like your favorites among these, do you have any specific things that, that are like your go-tos? I think... Uh, Slack, in a way, revolutionized our way of communicating in terms that we had so many different projects running at the same time. Mm. And so, Miro. And Miro was also a, a huge uh, help on kind of having a good overview of what's happening. Yeah. And, and uh, instead of looking through a lot of PDFs, you would just get a, a grasp idea of, of what's happening and a much, much freer tool. Mm. But I mean, if you're like, if your audience, <laughs> if they have any tips, we would like to have them. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're done yet. We're not no. set to those tools. It's just like those tools are things. They are solving a bit of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hope uh, they might leave some comments on, on the YouTube page or yeah. uh, maybe on Twitter. We'll, we'll get some tips from, from them. I think but I mean, is... from the daily work, it's like the... Yeah. It's Rhino and SolidWorks and the Adobe Suite, uh, yeah. as for many mm. uh, studios, I would say. Uh, but also, like we we love our three D printer and yeah. uh, prototypes in general. Yeah, and that's not typical at all as well. But it's really important to make like physical prototypes. It's so easy that you just oh, yeah. stay within the screen. Whenever you get out from the screen, you learn a lot more. Like just okay. stupid prototypes that. Doesn't you know that just try the yeah. cardboard? <laughs> uh, exactly, a cardboard or a paper or whatever, yeah. whatever you can find to. Yeah. Or just visit something yeah. to get uh, new impressions. And I mean that that's 
not news to anyone, but it's always it strikes you every time when you're I like. I saw that on your Instagram actually recently. Mm. You went to this like was it marble stone some kind yeah, of uh, yeah. stone? Uh, what what it's called? Uh, query. Stone, uh, stone, oh, yeah, stone yeah. query. Do you do that often? We don't do it that often. But we've done it before. We've done like a full tour of Småland to look at uh, oh. metal, metal like aluminium casting and aluminium uh, oh, wow. stamping and so on. And, and uh, this time we we took us for like a summer kind of end uh, trip with all the, the big group and we mm. went to a stone artist called uh, Paul Svensson oh. uh, to see his work mm. and how he works with stone as a material. And then we went to a quarry to look at how do you actually get stone out from the mountain. Yeah, um, I think the learning is that we should do it of, more often. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we want to do it. It's uh, mainly a question about time to get like, okay, now yeah. everyone should oh, go yeah. here. So Because that's we also realized that, that that is like real research. Mm. Yeah, instead of looking at, uh, you know, internet, finding, yeah, someone, and finding someone else who has found yeah. something, yeah. it's like, uh, two steps in between so in this case it's like uh, direct yeah and you you touch and feel much more and uh, yeah. were you doing these as part of a particular project or was it just general uh, general studio, yeah. time? General studio just, fun time exactly but then in projects as well we we try to like if we develop a product design a product for a, a specific target group we try to interview them or understand how they use existing products today or um, if we are going to do uh, something with a building we definitely want to mm. go there and take a look absolutely uh, I mean and that's really important because it's so easy that you ah, I can just uh, look at the Google Maps or uh, get the drawings <laughs> or uh, do some research or get the brief but uh, I mean, in a way, like suppliers, you could say, are, are a huge part of design. So, mm. like, it's easy to come up with the idea, but to make it real, you need somehow, uh, you know, all the tools to make that real or that idea as good as possible. Yeah. And then suppliers and, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I guess that's not unique in some, in any sense, but mm. it's always important and it's, uh, you have to have this reminder for yourself, like, okay, mm. let's, Let's get real. Let's go out in the real life to understand yeah. the problem, and uh, uh, and also like we still want to make more physical models mm. and and stuff like that mm. all the time because it's so easy mm. because it's much faster to work in the digital. But the learnings are greater with a simple model. Mm. Uh, so uh, cool. And th this is, I think, a nice segue into how you do things because we've spoken about what you do and I'm super curious about how you actually do it. So uh, maybe we can start at maybe zooming out and sort of the, like, I guess, administrative level. Like, um, according to your website, for example, you have four co-founders and uh, you all have like different job titles on the website. One of them, yeah. one of you is a CEO. Uh, you have industrial designer, design director, creative director, and these things can mean different things in different contexts. So, in the context of a design studio like yours, what is the meaning of these job titles? What, why do you call yourselves these things? And I would say it's uh, more or less to uh, only communicate to clients, mm. maybe sometimes. So, yeah. Uh, and and for it, like the communication is more or less what is the scope, uh, depending on what clients want, mm. um, and uh, the difference maybe between a creative director and a design director is that the creative director maybe looks at the bigger picture, and the design director maybe looks at the small edge, eventually mm. to have full control of that. And mm. It's more of a effort to make a structure to be able to grow even more, I would say, mm -hmm. and uh, to get a clear, especially when the team is growing as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's both for the client to, to easier navigate, okay, who should I call or get in contact with for mm -hmm. this question? Mm -hmm. But also when your team is growing, I mean, mm -hmm. if you have like four uh, chickens or roosters that are just wandering around and like, like oh, yeah. 
who should I ask for this? It's yeah. like, it's better to have like, okay, so that's the design director. I, I will ask him or oh, okay. like, uh, not that we want to make this pyramid structure, but no. in some sense have like a point towards something, uh, yeah. I would say. Mm. And uh, yeah, and that's what we are trying now. Maybe that's totally wrong in the future. Yeah. We will see, uh, I would say, but that's, we, we felt the need for it. So that's why we changed from not having titles too. Cool. I mean, so, but but from like a, a project perspective, it's as you say, like you are looking and more responsible for the details, mm -hmm. and Robert is more like the holistic visionary yeah. approach, and okay. I'm more. I don't use the CEO role in any sense. So I'm more from a strategic point to understand mm -hmm. the problem and that we have the correct brief and. And I think Axel's role now is design management or design manager. And I mean, he has the bigger role of controlling a creative process as well, yeah. which is a um, huge task. I mean, many people in our audience are like design students or design educators and, you know, I guess younger uh, design related professionals who are still sort of finding their way. So that's the reason why I... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. become curious and ask these questions for the benefit of those people who are still trying to understand these terminologies and these mm. uh, these roles that happen in these kinds of places. Uh, and so if you don't mind, for that reason, I'd like mm. to ask about some like operational details as well. Mm. Uh, so you have mentioned that the work that you do covers a lot of disciplines. There's architecture, there's product design, there's branding, and depending on the strategic needs of the client and the project, you uh, choose one of those. As far as I know, you start with the strategy. You don't start with the tactical sort of implementation of it, which theoretically sounds really cool. But in practice, I also uh, expect that there is a lot of differences between between how you execute these disciplines. Like, for example, you know, just a simple example is that for a graphic design project, I would expect the cost to be uh, on the order of thousands of dollars. Mm. For product design, the cost of a project will be tens of thousands of dollars, and for architecture, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm. So how do you uh, scope and plan these projects? Can you uh, describe like a real encounter with a client where you sit down and you decide on the scope and the size of this project and which of these disciplines to execute on? I think it's always client-based. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, because making the, not that we have done, but uh, make the graphics for Lufthansa mm -hmm. would, I would say, not cost thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, it would be in the hundreds th of thousands or even more. And uh, It always depends on the impact that you yeah. do for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so we try to understand what will this impact do for the client. Mm -hmm. Because we, as we said earlier, we want to work with design as a, like a strategic uh, important tool like uh, to to make it uh, impactful and then in that sense we make uh, value not ours as mm -hmm. uh, uh, many charge their clients mm -hmm. uh, so it's it more depends on the size of the client mm -hmm. and the impact you can make and the responsibilities or mm -hmm. the freedom you get so maybe when we work with a uh, as we talked about earlier about the coffee uh, I mean it's a one-man show today so mm -hmm. Then we get the coffee company. You mean? Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so um, I mean, then we get maybe more freedom, mm. uh, but so that what we see as a value for ourselves mm -hmm. and maybe what we can create for him, mm -hmm. but he doesn't necessarily have the money uh, in that sense. But then you work with a bigger client, then you have more limitations, mm -hmm. but the impact you will create within these limitations because it's a big uh, company mm. will be even greater so mm. then you can maybe charge more for mm. that so yeah. i don't know if that makes sense but uh, um, it it does especially since i have done some projects with various sizes of companies i also know that you know the bigger the company that you deal with the the bigger the administrative work that you have to do and the longer time it takes so uh, the, the the cost, the hours that you have to put in actually increase based on the size of the client that you're dealing with also, just purely because of uh, the size basically yeah, of the absolutely. project. Exactly, and and that's also part of the challenge mm -hmm. uh, because uh, working 
a lot of our clients uh, or yeah they they are maybe not that familiar in buying creativity oh yeah so that's a part of the challenge to talk the same language yeah. because maybe they are from a budget perspective or a project lead perspective where they have their timelines and their gates mm. and they need to fit in this creative space and process mm. to make the impact for the project mm. so that it's important to to educate each, each other i would say mm. to exactly. be able to to fulfill whatever they need but they need to understand our way of working as well uh, so, there's so much because more. there are two languages i would say in that and sense. there's a lot more communication only not only design uh, you could say it's the bigger the client the more you have to, have to talk to you know different uh, mm. parts of that uh, company and uh, somehow, in a way, you know, convince more people. The smaller the company, the, the straighter the process. Yeah, and this is really interesting. I was actually talking to a, a young designer a couple of weeks ago, and he used to be one of our students. Now he's graduated and he's looking for different jobs and different alternatives. And I told him that if you want to really uh, move forward and sort of take control of your career, you have to study and learn the language of business you have to mm. learn maybe about accounting maybe about marketing you know how companies are divided and how they work and sort of uh, the language and, and concept of business because even if you just want to do design if you sit down with a client and you look at this person you look at this company and you're able to see what's behind this one person the internal structure the internal goals and how, mm -hmm. how value and how uh, sort of uh, aims and purpose flows inside of this company then you will be able to make progress with that client and subsequently with your with your work in general uh, I don't know if this is actually good advice from your perspective who has more experience with this. That approaches our next challenge yeah. that I would say that we talk a lot about mm. and that's the artistic freedom oh, yeah. because you're a creative mm. so you want to be an artist in some sense mm. and adapting too much towards budgets and uh, time plans and structures and business language mm. is not necessarily uh, oh, yeah. creative mm. and that's a frustration and mm. we are like on the search of how could we combine that in the mm. best way possible so we can feel that we have the creative freedom and uh, creative time yeah, to exactly. you know react and uh, mm. do it again and learn and so but on. still like uh, yeah. deliver deliver uh, for our clients because mm. I, that would be the greatest of impacts if mm. we so we don't like kill the creativity with our, like all the limits, oh, yeah. but we don't like kill the possibilities of realizing the project because of the creative uh, like mm. uh, freedom that mm. we want. And that's like a, that's like a balance that we are still, of course, searching for, and uh, I guess we'll search for many years to come. But we think it's very important, mm. and we talk about it a lot because mm. sometimes. We could get really frustrated because we feel there are a lot of limits. Mm. Uh, the constellation that we had mm. from the beginning of different disciplines, mm. we bring in different uh, relations and clients and projects into the company. Mm. So I mean, I haven't worked with architecture before, but now I do, which is really cool. I don't call myself an architect, mm. but I could be a part of the process and bring some insights or questions or knowledge to mm. the table, which yeah, is really interesting. Cool. And it's like uh, so that's what we like and that's also mixes as we talked about like small and big companies mm. so then you get this mix which is really nice i would say for the both the creativity mm. we can also find like synergies between maybe big and small companies mm. and and projects but also like the rhythm mm. because when uh, when you work with the bigger clients they they move forward as fast as they can uh, hopefully <laughs> but it's never as fast as we can yeah. move forward and then you work with the really small clients and then we are the bigger one maybe not moving forward as fast as they mm -hmm. want and mm -hmm. so 
you get this like pace oh, yeah. And, yeah. and also the I mean the limit somehow from the client is quite mm. important I mean at some point you also need a boundary for the creativity oh yeah so you you want uh, uh, somehow you have to have a wall to uh, bounce bounce your um, mm. uh, and and I think having those kind of clear lines from the beginning always makes a good project. It's like having a really good brief mm. is what sets the possibility for the, uh, uh, for the project. Okay. Because if it's totally free, then you can go on for forever. With some clients, we have like a super clear brief. Mm. But so in some cases, we don't. Mm. And then it's up to us, we think, to understand mm. the problem better. So to ask a lot of questions to the client, to maybe do some research and mm. uh, and vis visit customers that will use this uh, mm. product or uh, mm. uh, experience or whatever, to, to understand and create a better brief for ourselves. So we know what is the goal of this project. And mm. in, in that case, when we, we do it ourselves, it's really fun because maybe we can find an angle that we would like to do this. Hmm. You mentioned the brief, and in, in the world of design, we all know what a brief looks like, and we also know what the end products look do like. Do you? Uh, well, <laughs> some, everyone does have their own version of it. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, everyone has something that they imagine when, yeah, they, yeah. when they talk about the brief. So yeah. It's not like they have nothing. It is different though. It feels like that way sometimes. <laughs> do you does the form of do you have a format for your like brief or does it change from client to client? It changes, I would say. Yeah, I mean uh, as as I said before it's it's like it all depends on the client. Yeah. Some some are like super specific. We yeah. want to we have this product, mm. uh, we want to make it this, it need to fulfill this, blah, um, blah, blah. It's going to be uh, new in these kind yes. of senses, but uh, mm. these needs to be kept the same way as before yeah. and so on. So. Mm. Or uh, we want to make an exhibition about this. Mm. It's going to be between these two dates. We have this budget and so on and so on. Mm. But there can also be like, we want to explore this. Mm. Mm. We want to make... We want to target a new uh, group of customers, or we want to make a future exhibition of what will, yeah, what will come in the future, and we don't know yet, and we want you to find out, and and uh, so that's also mm. a mixture. But mm. uh, interesting. Do you but uh, when they're good, I think like when they're good, they're uh, well thought out both from the customer and, and uh, we've been able to debrief them mm. so that we've been able to kind of question the brief mm. a couple of times. That's usually when they become good. Mm. Uh, usually the really loose ones where yeah. there's nothing really to grasp onto, mm. those are... Uh, those are really hard. Those are really hard, yeah. yeah so you need a couple of life. iterations on the brief to to make it into something that's like actionable, I and guess. I, I would just uh, like to add, I mean, it's like you don't want to get too standardized either, I would mm. say. No, we don't want to because if we have this format and we always work on this and uh, follow the process and so on, then you just become a machine. Oh yeah. And how creative is that? So you want something that can adapt mm. and you listen oh. and you, you ask questions, you understand and you challenge questions mm. or the brief and, and so on. So you try to find that creative height that you want mm. because... If you're like, yeah, first we do these steps and da da da, and that's, I would say, maybe super smart from a business perspective, right. just to have like this standardized product. Like, oh, you want a new product? It will take this long and cost this amount of money. Mm. And you're like, okay, perfect, dunk. And then another one, we say the same thing and da da da. Mm. But how fun is that for us? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I it's like then we just become this big machinery. So just, this word creative mm. is very rich in different meanings you know everyone yeah and important does. i would say yeah for sure yeah everyone has different like uh, meanings feelings and and sort of uh, associations about it can you uh, concretely give examples of maybe one project where it was like from a perspective of being creative it was very successful and very satisfying uh, and compare that to a project where, from the perspective of being creative, 
uh, it wasn't didn't, didn't really live up to what you want to have in your life. I think we've done very successful kind of exhibitions mm. uh, in the sense that they've been uh, both for the for us they've had the right height of creative kind of level where we feel mm. like we've you know achieved a, a greater kind of aesthetic feel and experience, mm. but also where like you've heard that. Uh, people have had a really good time visiting that spot, mm. yeah. visiting that experience. And, and I would also say uh, the restaurant in Stockholm, uh, Deg Labbet, yeah, yeah. Uh, really go and eat there. When we came up with ideas, they just executed them. So, uh, mm. because they were opening a pizzeria in Stockholm, in mm. a part of Stockholm called Vasastan, mm. which is a, is a really saturated uh, yeah. market for a a pizza place yeah and we created this like okay so we watched we looked at the problem and like okay how could we create an impact mm. i mean it's lovely that they want to open another pizza place but how will they actually mm. not be like uh, bankrupt in mm. in a day <laughs> because there are too many then we created this brand that was like bright and yellow and like all the Mm. Uh, pizza carts were yellow, so you could spot them like a mile away. And they are really sharp guys uh, running this place. Mm. So there was, of course, like location and their impact on social media and all the aspects. But that case became like really, we gave them input on how we would like to do this mm. creatively. And they just, yeah, we trust you. And that became a super success. Mm. Uh, I think they, they, uh, so like 300% more pizzas oh. within the first two weeks mm. than they had expected or something like oh, that. Nice. Mm. Um, so that's a really nice one. And mm. uh, then because that's like more of a from a business perspective, but mm. they gave us the total freedom and like, okay, really cool. We trust you. Mm. And with exhibitions, <laughs> it's really fun because you have these, they want the creative height mm, because yeah. it's an exhibition so it should yeah. be more art history and uh, and a really bad case <laughs> <laughs> i mean I, there's also the levels of bad but sometimes there's we've done projects like uh, we don't do bad cases no, <laughs> <laughs> no that's the oh. that's the goal but uh, and, and sometimes they're not bad in the sense that you know, ideas are uh, specifically good or bad, mm. but if the company are not able to execute the ideas, mm. it doesn't help that it's a good idea. Yeah. So sometimes our uh, level of ideas have to match the level of competence in the company. Mm. Uh, otherwise, it takes too long time to mm. launch things. Uh, or it's in production wise, it's going to cost too much, yeah. uh, which will make the product too expensive in the end or mm. the service too expensive. So I, I think those levels you learn all life, like yeah. you won't ever be fully learned on it, but you can always learn that, oh, this time it was actually a little bit too complex or, mm. you know, pushing the limits of what that company could mm. achieve. Um, and. I mean, I have several experiences like that mm. where I felt like either I should push more or push less. Mm. Yeah, and maybe done some more research in that sense, maybe find out a bit more about the budget and uh, more about the organization and, and how will yeah, you manage decisions yeah. and so on. Yeah. Because you, uh, we get so fired up yeah. within a project, so we're like, okay, and this is a great idea, and we just push, mm. and maybe we had the brief from the beginning to push, yeah. but we didn't know about the limits within how we could push. Mm. And then we are fired up, and we present this idea, and they are like, yeah, this is great, so we get even more energy, and we continue to work on that. And then they're like, but we, and the next time we meet, we won't have the budget for this. And we're oh. like, okay. <laughs> so then it's like back to the drawing board or mm. scaling down. And then, yeah, that's uh, that's actually a very frequent complaint that I hear from people who work with designers. I have an acquaintance who makes uh, different gadgets out of plastic, for example, and he has commission. He commissions a lot of things to industrial designers, different objects, different shapes, and he frequently complains that they deliver these 
designs which he can't manufacture on his machines that they require like this complicated machine or this complicated uh, die or mold that will cost him another hundred thousand dollars or whatever yeah. so uh, it pays off I guess to do research into the capabilities of your clients in terms Absolutely. of what they can manufacture what they can execute um, I Absolutely. have so th speaking of like I guess bad experiences um, it's we, we kind of avoid speaking about those a lot of the times but I find it extremely productive and from yeah. a, uh, both a career standpoint and from a personal you know psychological happiness um, standpoint I find it very uh, productive to n know what you're not going to do and to be clear about it and like to say no to, mm. to put it in a, like a, mm. uh, a general term. So I'm wondering if you had any experiences where you've said no to particular clients mm. and particular projects. It's like a relationship. Uh, mm. When you realize that this relationship will never work, mm. it will never become a good project mm. uh, in this relationship or whatever we you know, find with a client, mm. then you have to say stop because then it becomes uh, draining with energy and uh, draining your creativity uh, mm. and somehow uh, the, you know, what we're looking for is when we can somehow excel and become even better at mm. what we do. Mm. And uh, I think the clients are really important in that. Mm. I mean... Uh, yeah, and, and that's also part uh, of like uh, growing and aging and maturing as a company because uh -huh. in the beginning you don't say no of uh, several reasons uh, mm. almost I mean of course you can but I would say it's like the last year or mm. so we've been saying no because mm. now we we know more of what we want to do and we have learned more about maybe not saying yes to uh, uh, all the projects because mm. we, we try to get more information before we make a decision but it's also the uh, that energy and that like okay yeah we got a new assignment a new mm. client yes yeah. let's do this it's gonna be amazing mm. so see. it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned uh, like your reputation and putting your signature on mm. things I was uh, reading uh, David Ogilvy recently mm. like a legendary advertising writer and he was saying in his book that uh, advertising writers should sign their adverts like th there mm. should be the name of the agency on the corner of the magazine ad and when you do that it increases the quality and mm. the sales and the results Absolutely. by very uh, significant degrees mm. but i remembered uh, when i was uh, younger uh, when you're at the bus stop mm. you always have these uh, like ads yeah yeah, yeah. Ads and they were always the name of the agency, oh, yeah. uh, so you could uh, read like, oh, first man bored and first. Exactly. Uh, Apparently, uh, that increases the quality of the ads too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I think so. I think that be a good lesson for uh, clients to. I mean, that that has been a, a typical traditional way of doing it that you always put the name of the designer onto the product. Mm or whatever it is, or, or architecture in, mm. in uh, old fashion where you writ it yeah. on the building. Yeah. Uh, because then you know that people really will take care of how it's going to yeah. look and become and feel and the experience. So Yeah, you know it's a fancy building when it has like a plate in, at the entrance with the exactly. name of the architect. Yeah. That's, that's how you know you're in the good building. And uh, like uh, just having that on the you know, lower side of a, a stool or something that, mm. that you can find out who did it. Yeah. Like who put the stamp on it and mark on it. Mm. I think it's like you're really showing that you're proud of your work mm. and you stand behind it and like yeah, I can meet you in the street and see you in the eyes and yeah. I'm like, yeah, we've done this building and we're proud of it. Mm. But nowadays it feels like ah, uh, just another building or just mm. another product. And yeah. that's another part for us that we would like, to, I mean, we're proud of what we're doing, yeah. even if it's like not always the end result is not always the way we wanted mm. of uh, a lot of different uh, reasons but mm. so we want to take pride and not only communicating within social media mm. and so on so mm. uh, we went to Helsingborg uh, the other week um, for a project with IKEA and then we we walked down the street and saw this building where it was like this mm. sign in stone mm. uh, automobiles and carriers mm. so it's been there since horse and oh, wow. the carrier and the automobiles. I mean, 
that's then you know that like okay we're gonna be here for a while <laughs> when you put your yeah. sign into mm. stone and like and now it was like um, hairdressing salon or something but mm. uh, oh, yeah. the mm. sign was still there and that yeah. would be really cool like to to have that I mean I would see I would like to see more pride mm. in the longer term than just some likes on social media yeah uh, and uh, and also like that things are genuine mm. we talked about that a lot if you if you make something in plastic mm. make it look like plastic and use the the nice ways you can form plastic no mm. don't make it look like wood mm. but it is plastic yeah and use like uh, wood when it's wood and mm. stone when it's stone and yeah all those like genuine materials and oh yeah i think that that's also the you know when the clients have the same philosophy in that sense as we do that's when it's a good client and, and when we feel that it's not they're like not triggering any of our kind of what we like mm. and then um, that's when we should stop okay speaking of uh, signs and philosophy and materials i think this is a perfect segue into another thing that i wanted to ask you which is uh basically like and i have two ways of asking this one is more abstract and i guess i'll start with that one so um wh what even is your design philosophy so for example if you could scale your studio to infinity you could have infinite people working for you all the projects in the world so you can design the whole world all of the architecture yeah. all of the products all of the graphics in the world it's op what would the world look like? Like, what are what are some words that would describe our world designed by OP? There will be big statues of uh, us <laughs> all over the globe. And <laughs> no, no we, we had this, we had the saying the other day that we are fighting ugliness with good ideas. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and and what we we mean with good ideas is like as we talked about before that you know optimizing. Uh, materials for what they're good at mm. and finding good ideas instead of uh, styling things after yeah so trying to make things real so they feel real and they mm. uh, they what you experience of the product or space is real mm. um, and really having you know creating more you know fun spaces to to live in to to um, socialize in um, more products that are even more fun and, and you know it's about seeing what it is for what it is yeah. uh, i would say i mean if it's temporary or a single use or whatever make it in that sense mm -hmm. then and don't like because nowadays it seems like a lot of effort is going in to something mm -hmm. uh, to create something but you know that within a year you will launch the next product yeah. mm -hmm. so you don't give it that love or uh, whatever yeah. you need to minimizing uh, kind of an artificial world mm. but also at the same time maximizing a colorful world mm. Mm. so that you know it's a, a colorful experience in that sense mm. we don't have any principles it would, it would be, if we should uh, take over the world uh, mm. we need that but uh, mm. we, we're working on it yeah, and i mean it. Uh, i think it was steve jobs who said that the dots connect looking backwards mm. so to connect the dots you need the dots in the first place yeah if you, before you have the dots you can't know uh, how your philosophy or how your your sort of idea is going to turn out before you actually do things oh, exactly. but it's very easy to look back and then extract a philosophy from what you've already been doing from a collection of work that you've done already yeah. uh, but in practical terms so you've been saying uh, I don't know real fun colorful so in practical terms let's say that I'm a younger designer maybe I'm a student and I want to learn by copying the master so I want to copy the work of OP mm -hmm. to learn how things are done mm -hmm. what are some uh, like aesthetic elements like colors materials typefaces anything uh, that we find in like maybe every OP project or mm -hmm. things that you like to use and some things that you like to avoid maybe yeah. what would be yeah. those things I mean those things are really uh, maximizing an impression and maximizing the the total kind of uh, experience of what we do and mm -hmm. I think doing that it's like always cleaning out uh, all the fuss mm -hmm. so that the message becomes as 
clear as possible. Mm. And f with fuss, we mean like styling, uh, getting rid of as much as possible, but still keeping a, a sense of, uh, how do you say, it still needs to be a strong uh, aesthetic feel. Mm. Uh, and I think those are the hardest things to combine. Mm. Um, uh, but in a way, we, mm -hmm. are, uh, we try to always uh, minimize uh, somehow uh, weird uh, kind of aesthetical uh, mm. things and try to uh, keep it simple. Mm. Keep it to, you know, we like, we like geometric shapes, we, we like uh, mm, uh, strong colors in, in that sense, but we also like, you know, it all depends on what it should uh, do in the end. Maybe in a couple of years or so you will find some kind of, you can look back and see some kind of red thread mm. through the whole thing, but I think it's also about being creative. You need to explore, and oh, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it could be that you have like really strict uh, uh, limits, and you be creative within that field. Yeah. But I think we want more to combine different knowledges and educations and ways of thinking, and yeah. be more creative in that sense. And then we cannot be that strict with a typeface, three mm. colors, and mm. oh, so yeah. on. It and. We want to explore as well, uh, I would say. And I can see that here, actually. When I look around in your studio and there, there are various objects that you have designed or different prototypes, and I yeah. can see that there's no like, you know, patterns, lines, shapes or anything. There's none of that. It's just the material and it's very honest. It's like steel, wood, whatever it is, plastic. But there's still some playfulness. There's interesting, curious elements in all of them. Yeah. I mean, like this thing makes me wonder, for example, what is this thing that we have in the middle of the... <laughs> it's Jenner. <laughs> I think it's, it's made for ventilation, but yeah. the, the, it's uh, stainless steel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, what we aim to do is, um, in, in a short sentence, I would say, it's like when you, when you have a good idea, you have to design less. Oh yeah. If you have a bad idea, you have to design more and it becomes harder to design. Mm. Mm. So the, the better, the, the cleaner, the simpler, the, the more impactful the idea is, the wow. simpler it is to design. And, and that's what we're always, okay. depending on if it's a graphical project or a product design or architecture, we always want to have good ideas so that instead of talking about the design, you talk about the good functions and ideas wow. that the design has done. Mm. If you have a good idea, you need to design less. I'm going to tweet that, man. That's, <laughs> that's really smart. Are there any um, people or other companies or, I don't know, artistic movements or whatever that you look up to, like any influences that you that yeah. have really I mean, influenced, I guess? Of course. Work? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. I, uh, we look both into what's happening around us, but also really what has, you know, some of our biggest maybe influence uh, are some of those kind of designers from the past who, who were able to do both the kind of bigger picture, being able to do a big mm -hmm. scope, both architecture, product, graphic, but they were also really good at executing those big ideas. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in, in Sweden, we had Sigurd Levens and Gunnar Asplund, which were I mean, they were pioneers in architecture and design, and mm. they, they really you know, set the pace for all Scandinavian design. I think we're also like really interested in how did they... Be I mean, of course, aesthetically, they're really pleasing their designs and everything, but also like how did they manage to go through with those mm. kind of things? And like, Absolutely. it's like we also look up to other agencies within maybe different fields, like, but how did they manage to grow their business and be mm, yeah. in that sense. As, I mean, it could be also not only from an aesthetic point of view. It's like they have navigated through the landscape. Mm. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, Would you what's... care to give some examples of who those are? Yeah, but I mean, Gunnar Asplund, Sigurd Levens, I mean, uh, but also like we have visited uh, Luciana uh, many times, also like just from a building perspective, it's mm. it's like old but really nicely done and everything. And well, we talk about like um, 
Forsman Boden Fors, of course, mm. because here in Gothenburg, uh, they're, they're also huge, from, huge. yeah, they're, they're, they're and they have navigated business. through that jungle of agencies in a yeah. really good way and become like legends. Yeah. And, and and we're like, we don't know yet, but we would like to have a chat. <laughs> but how did they manage that? Yeah. I mean, it's like, that's also interesting. But I think those, yeah, I mean, in we had, you know, in Sweden or like in Finland, you had Alvar Aalto who mm. were able to, and his company, Aina Aalto, they were able to do all of it. Yeah. I think those are the, you know, the, the most... Uh, the, the ones that I can look up to most yeah. mm. in the US, you had Ray and Charles Eames who yeah. were able to do, you know, chairs, architecture, graphics, oh, yeah. and they could really execute on that because there's a lot of companies who uh, try, but they, they don't have all the crafts and learnings to do it. I think seeing design as one, basically, mm. I mean, um, because we believe it is one, They're, they all interact. Oh, yeah, that's one of the premises of, of this project of design discipline as well. They all interact and they all have something to learn from each other. But speaking yeah. of influences, uh, I really love books and I wonder if there's a book or uh, really any resource, you know, an article, a YouTube channel, a website, whatever, that you recommend very frequently to people that you work with to check uh, out. A recent book I read was uh, Sprint oh, yeah. by... Uh, uh, Jake Now. Yeah. Yeah, Jake Knapp. Yeah, that was uh, that was a bit. Yeah, I think it was interesting. I mean, uh, it really pushed the boundaries of how fast you can make a sprint. Mm. I think with the qualities, mm. uh, that was interesting. And uh, been listening a bit to um, a podcast and YouTube channel called Future. Oh yeah, the future. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really American and maybe uh, uh, feels a bit awkward as a Swedish person to look yeah. at it. And but from a business perspective and the educational perspective of starting your own business mm. is really interesting. I think there, uh, there should be more of those. Uh, there's, there's quite a. F uh, I mean, the I'm network. really missing the transparency within uh, the business, uh, mm. like knowing the backgrounds and. Uh, oh yeah. I mean not only hear about the success and oh, everything yeah. it's like yeah. yeah sometimes it's like shit and we yeah. learned this and then we could pivot or like oh, yeah. uh, make changes that maybe uh, gave us this opportunity yeah and i think that's uh, there's a window for that mm. i would say within the podcast uh, or like YouTube market oh, or yeah. do you have a favorite failure in your career that set you up for success in that and it could be like uh, you uh, you um, you start a project with a client and uh, you have like this budget and mm. uh, this time frame and then you work your ass off like three times as much and mm. then you're like ah oh, maybe that wasn't the, the best of choices Mm. And uh, they could be like, yeah, as we talked about, that you get fired up and you think you will like revolutionize the world mm. with this coffee mug, and then <laughs> you uh, don't have the opportunities later on in the project to succeed that way. Mm. Uh, did a did a tent for a car once? That was a huge failure. A tent for a car, so it like, like it's an add-on tent for a car. Oh wow! Uh, to like sleep in. To like uh, change, uh, I mean, it, the client, the car company wanted us to do that, mm. uh, but uh, it somehow oh. was an impossible project. It didn't work. But, okay. uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I think you, the learning somehow is that your the the your because your stomach uh, before starting the project was like this will never work, oh. and then <laughs> and then after doing the project, it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, sometimes. You should kind of listen to your stomach uh, mm. from the beginning, and in a sense, you want you don't want one chance. I mean, that's why you want to fail forward. You want to have a client who wants to do uh, something, but then they don't want to stop with mm. that only thing. Mm. Then you want uh, to do it again, uh, mm. and then you you know improve it even more, and then you want to do a new one yeah. and improve. So. And like having clients who don't only see at uh, making, uh, how do you say, one hit wonders. Mm. We want to make, you know, uh, constant hits all the time. Yeah, because and, uh, we always walk into this relation for a long term. Mm. 
and uh, that could sometimes be a failure when we break up much oh, yeah. more earlier than we yeah. thought. <laughs> I, I mean, and then you're like, okay. To me, that's kind of like the the essence of design is like iteration and trying things and failing and doing things more than once, doing yeah. it three, four, five times, exactly. each time increasing in in terms of the investment and the effort and the like the definition of the thing, and then eventually arriving somewhere. Not just you know, okay, I made this. This yeah. is it. Yeah. That's not. It's not design. If you yeah. do that, maybe it's engineering. Maybe it's something else. Might even be uh, an artistic piece or whatever. But yeah. to me, the meaning of design is iteration. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a thing about design that is obvious to you, but you observe is not obvious to a lot of other people. The failures you can really see when someone has not done all the ideas. Mm. They're mm. just like taking a quick one. Mm. Uh, you know, like a, a coffee cup where you can't fit your finger into mm. the... Then you know that people, you know, things that are stupid and not smart mm. usually become ugly in a way. Mm. Uh, yeah, I see. And I think those sense, I mean, th that's where I think we can see it quite quickly. Mm. Or if we don't, uh, mm. that was my point, that we maybe put a bit more extra time into yeah. it to understand. Yeah. So. As you say, like uh, uh, if you have a good idea, it's not hard to design. <laughs> no, so it's, it's like a survival of the fittest idea. Oh yeah, yeah. evolution. Uh, evolution <laughs> somehow makes things uh, look good. Oh yeah, you know, like uh, <laughs> like a lot of things in nature look good and mm. has a pure you know idea and uh, meaning why they look like they do. Interesting. So evolution. Um, studying copying things and and sort of understanding the intuition of why things look good never never copy but learn maybe yeah like sure the... i mean you i guess as an exercise as yeah, a exactly. as a learning experience copying is very very valuable like um yeah because we don't want to make copies yeah so not not when you make it not when you like deliver to the client but no. You know, I was, uh, I, I had to make some graphic designs for uh, this project for like social media, uh, YouTube thumbnails, whatever, and I'm not really educated in graphic design actually. Uh, so I had to sit down and study and the, the absolute most valuable learning experience that I had was when I took uh, the famous book by uh, Josef Müller Brockmann, mm -hmm. uh, Grid Systems in Graphic Design. I put it in front of my keyboard, mm -hmm. I turned to the page where he has like these examples of his work and I started copying all of them. I mm. do like 20 of them in Figma, exactly replicating the layout. And I'm like, ah, okay, that's, that's where, so that has to be proportional to that. And your line height has to be proportional to your margin because then it fits this way and it aligns and so on. Um, but I'm wondering, so we also talked about like contextual awareness and awareness of views, like if your finger fits in the coffee cup and things like that. Mm. So when we teach design, uh, we talk a lot about like research methods and things. So we have things like design sprints, as you mentioned, uh, user-centered design, design thinking. There's different names of these like recipes that you can follow. Uh, what do you think about these? And when you, you do your research or what you call research, what does that involve? What is the process? What are some things that you do? I mean, it depends on the project and the client mm. and, and so on and the scope and the time frame. I mean... Uh, if we get a clear picture in the beginning and it's a tight time frame or, or we maybe get a early ideas early in the discussions and so on, we start maybe working on that mm. directly. Like if it's then somehow we, it's already done in, on some level. Mm, exactly. exactly, it could be. And then maybe we, we, we get stuck and then we do some research and so mm. on. But uh, in some cases, we need to do a lot of research, mm -hmm. uh, like interviewing people, mm -hmm. and it's always good to meet someone that will be. Mm. Uh, Don't be afraid of just using or living or mm. uh, experiencing the thing you're designing. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, we've been up with truck drivers like five in the morning, oh. just interviewing them when they're driving about uh, some products. And cool. mm. we've been uh, interviewing organizations for uh, how their future offices will look like. Mm. Or uh, we've been, yeah, so it's like, Meeting it could the be. people who actually experience this every day. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, and we've realized that if we have a like certain amount of those meetings, mm. we have, a, we've, gotten a lot of knowledge in a short time 
So it's just for us to be able to yeah. do better work, basically. And you don't need that many meetings. No. I mean, it's yeah. like maximum 10, yeah. Yeah, I would say. Sure. It's like, even in like academic... after like five, you have almost like 80% of the findings, I would yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, even in academic research, you know, the expectation is that you have to be like super thorough, you know, yeah. you have to cover everything like... Very quantitative. Yeah, if you're doing like interviews, it's usually very deep, you know, you're talking to someone for two, three hours, yeah. then you do 10 of them, you know, you don't do... You don't do 20 or 30, yeah. that's sort of... But Sometimes we... And observing. We, and observing, yeah. Only observing, like having, yeah. having time to observe how uh, a person uses a space or an object mm. without them knowing that you mm. are looking at them. Yeah. It's quite fun as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, with the truck drivers, for instance, we, mm. uh, they had these like crane operating trucks so mm. they could uh, uh, hoist like windows up to buildings or whatever. Mm. And I mean, we spent some time with them when they were driving, interviewing them, and then we were just went to them to the site where they did their work, mm. just walking around, looking how they were doing things, wow. and then maybe ask some more questions about. Okay, so uh -huh. you talked about safety; that's really important. But you and you should never uh, walk under your uh, your load mm. that you were hoisting. Mm. But you cool. you just did that. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, wow, did I do that? <laughs> what, why is that? Oh, that's because I had to la la la. Uh, so then you maybe pick up these small details and mm. maybe you get insights to, okay, so uh, if we could get the guy to not die when he's working, uh. it's like a super benefit for this product. I, I've taken a lot of your time already. I have a okay. few more questions, very few, maybe three, uh, before we yeah. call it a day. Um, and as I said, many people in our audience are design students and design educators. So I'm wondering, like for a student, for example, who's in school today and they have uh, one year, maybe two years left in their education where they can just study things, experiment, do things. What would be some really valuable skills or topics that they could invest in? if uh, in, in the near future they would like to either work at a place like this or start a place like this or be in this uh, business of design? As you, you mentioned in the question, to explore and to like try out new things, mm. that's really important because it's, it feels like it's really easy today that you educate yourself mm. to this degree. Mm. And then you just, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to work with that on this company that specializes in that. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's, it's really nice to maybe explore and try and don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe, like, as you said, you're not a graphic designer, but hey, of course you can do graphic design uh, without an education. You, you just like need to maybe try it out and maybe you learn something and maybe you're like, oh, that's, this is not my thing. And, I think also, don't be afraid in that sense. No, as a beginning, and then uh, I agree. And, and for for this uh, for students, I would say definitely learn uh, learn tools and learn many tools to design, mm. so that the tool doesn't become what limits your kind of uh, potential. Mm. Mm. Because uh, I, I remember that as a common thing where people didn't learn certain tools, and yeah. then you only create certain objects or uh, ideas or spaces because of mm. you not being able to do them, basically. Mm. And I think uh, having time to, to, uh, to be a student, you should really learn the, the, the craft of how to design yeah. uh, so that you then can come up with good ideas. Yeah. And then take that skills and make if it's physical, I mean, make it physical. Mm. I mean, graphic design is also physical. You can just print it. I mean, uh, mm. and then you get the feel of it because I think yeah. that's really interesting and educational. And I, from from our perspective, now when we've been a company for a while, we we uh, time to time get applications mm. like uh, for internship or a job and so on. And it's always interesting to see the one that say the ones that have done their prototypes. Mm. Uh, they, it's not just a sketch or a, a rendering. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's also a physical model. Mm -hmm. Even if it's from cardboard, mm. it's like, yeah. okay, they have mm. done this and learned something. Or and yeah, exactly. And I think it's, 
uh, it's really important to learn the tools so they don't become a limitation, but it's also really important to don't be afraid to just make it in the physical space mm -hmm. so you can interact with it. And I think still, even though we, you know, there's all of these digital tools, one of the absolute best tools is a pen and a paper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like uh, <laughs> having that tool, there's no faster way of communicating an idea. Mm. And uh, I don't see how that will change. Even though it becomes a digital pen, it won't change. So I think having the speed to be able to do, you know, the survival of the fittest idea or whatever it would be, to be able to do many ideas and to be able to iterate, mm. I think having that tool is uh, of the greatest importance. Yeah. And explore. I mean, uh, try out the internship at uh, agency that does this, mm. like graphic design, and you yeah. learn, like you have six months and learn so much about graphic design and mm. can uh, get the experience in real projects and mm. so on. And then maybe you go to to um, uh, more uh, product design mm -hmm. and, and I mean learn the trade yeah, yeah exactly yeah. I think that's also good it's like if it's like you 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 educate yourself and then you should just be ready to work and yeah. uh, it's I think it's really good to learn uh, to practice design in mm. like in the workspace oh yeah and don't decide that you're that you are uh, fully learned. You will oh, never oh, be yeah. fully learned. Oh yeah, I know. There's, there's a saying that you're when yeah, you're yeah. around 80, then that's when you're the best uh, designer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, uh, yeah, true, good thing to know. What I see at the university is most people um, refrain from maybe teaching the tools. I'm talking about the teachers now. They they d try not to talk about the tools. You know, they don't talk about Figma, Photoshop, wherever. They don't teach exactly how to implement, but they always talk about the principles and the, uh, the theories and whatnot. Um, but I think it what really pays off is to actually learn learn the tools, and mm. then once you learn one of the tools, it's very easy to transfer that skill to like from Figma to Photoshop, from Absolutely. Photoshop to Illustrator, from that to like whatever people will invent five years later. It's like a language. Yeah, so. but if you never do that, you can learn all the theory that you want, and you will never produce a design without actually using the tools. So whatever tools exist in that moment in time, it's very worthwhile to. To learn those things, yeah. you become a really good asset also when you come to a company if you know the tools. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. You can help from day one, like from day one. Oh mm. yeah, for, for sure. sure. But speaking of times and being current, so what are you excited about these days? Like, what's next for OP at this point in time? We we have challenges both for the company and uh, in the <laughs> for us privately. Mm. We're actually yeah. We're uh, all four founders also becoming fathers. Oh wow! <laughs> all at the same time, basically yeah, during wow. this uh, this autumn. So wow. yeah, uh, it's gonna be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a new challenge. Is it the first time for all of you? Yeah. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> uh, yeah, we're growing. Like uh, the fam the OP family is now nine, and and uh, hopefully we're getting a bit bigger uh, mm -hmm. during the year and and. And onwards, and then also, of course, the the Stockholm uh, mm. thing with uh, opening up an office. We need to find one first, but yeah. that's always a fun thing, and really and cool. see yeah. what that could mean for us, and uh, how we could maybe expand a bit there, and so on. So uh, we have a fun partnership with a company called Skewed, also, mm. um, which we work with, and uh, it's a kind of a creative collective. Mm. Yeah. Say. And we do a lot of projects together with them as well. Um, and with them, we're starting up an office in London as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. So uh, they are mainly the driving force for that, of mm. course, but uh, we're part of the collective. And so that's also interesting to see what we can do with being more present in, yeah, I mean, abroad. That's mm. going international is also a, a dream, of course. Mm. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say that we haven't covered so far? Is there maybe a question that you wish I have asked or a piece of advice or request to our audience? Don't uh, do crap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't design ugliness. No, uh, 
No, I mean, uh, don't Do be good. afraid to fail, I would say. Uh, don't fail be forward. To, I mean, exactly. just try it out. Fail and learn. Yeah. yeah. Do but it again. I would say uh, a question would be how, uh, or an interesting topic mm. would be, how do we work creatively mm. in a, this digital era? Mm. I mean, it's yeah. always, I mean, we have had Skype and, and so on for many years, mm. but now because of the pandemic, it really like took off. Mm. And uh, I think there are a lot of companies just uh, thinking about how they could uh, create products and so on that could help us that are uh, working within the creative field. But mm. Uh, I mean, now there are a lot of students within your community, mm. but that could also be interesting to see their point of view of how mm. are they thinking about the future of working yeah. and what are their expectations within the, within the field and the workplace. Mm. And when it goes much faster now to a digital era, I mean, uh, mm. Well, I think that would be interesting to see if there are any good ideas and, mm. and reflections yeah. on mm. that one. Because I think we're in this exploration phase for the whole yeah. industry, I would say. Mm. That's really interesting. I do hope that people will leave some comments on YouTube, on mm. Twitter, uh, on Reddit, where I post uh, these episodes also. Mm. Maybe we'll get some ideas from them. Mm. Uh, my kind of limited observation because I'm not like in my 20s anymore so I only observe now uh, looking at my cousins or you know there's my students and people I'm observing that you know video is really becoming a thing we have like TikTok uh, mm. which is like a super sort of rising platform yeah. these days um, the way that people consume and also produce video has yeah. really changed it's reached the masses you know yeah. I guess 10 or 20 years ago, if you wanted to make a video for, for whatever reason, you really had sort of had to like fire up a computer, import from your camera, do exactly. your editing things. Today, it's like your phone, blah, 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 10 seconds, your video is done. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of the internet, where can we find you on the internet if, if our audience wants to reach out to you for... Uh, yeah, you can reach us on our website, OP. Yeah. Uh, oplineweb.se uh, hmm. but you yes. also have officeofpossibilities.se right yes yeah. okay. but that's not but the easiest way to <laughs> <laughs> and then we have way. op underline update at instagram hmm. uh, so uh, right. those are our two uh, yeah. main channels right now cool I'll uh, and my number is not <laughs> <laughs> I'll put up the links uh, on the, in the descriptions and the article on our website, and I'll put your number up there yeah. as well. I have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> cool. This was so much fun, guys. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much for for sitting with us. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank Likewise. You. Hope uh, that I will see you again numerous times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On for camera sure. and off camera as well. You're Thanks welcome. a lot. More than welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to episode 11 of Design Discipline, a conversation with the multidisciplinary design studio Office of Possibilities, or OP in short. If you found value in this conversation, you will probably enjoy past and future episodes of Design Discipline as well, where we explore and explain the vast landscape of design through concepts and conversations. So go ahead and download and subscribe to our podcast. Like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Follow us on Twitter and Instagram as at Design Discipline and join the membership program on our website, designdiscipline.com.